Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Leah Hollins, the Chair of the Board of Directors of Island Health. I acknowledge with respect and gratitude the Lekwungen peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, whose traditional territory I am calling from, and the Cowichan tribes, including the Malahat, Halalt, Liaxon, Staminas, Penelicut, Didadat, and Subaset. First Nations, whose lands we are virtually visiting tonight. I also acknowledge the many nations within the Vancouver Island First Nation families of the Coast Salish, New Chalneth, and Kwakwakiwak peoples who have cared and nurtured this land for all time and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, and care on these lands. I recognize the Métis, Inuit, and the other Indigenous peoples who live in communities across the region we serve. I recognize the harm caused by settler peoples and the lasting effects on the health and wellness of indigenous peoples, which still exist today, including in the health system. I pause to recognize the five main residential schools, including the Kuiper Island Residential School in this region. We honor the children who never came home the survivors and families. As a governing board, we are committed to surfacing the truth, recognizing our collective responsibility, participating in healing and reconciliation to address systemic racism and ensuring indigenous people can receive equitable and culturally safe health and wellness and care. We're really pleased to be here with you tonight and thank you to those who have submitted questions. This type of community engagement, virtual for now, provides board members with an opportunity to hear directly from the people and communities we serve. As we see more and more of our population vaccinated, we look forward to returning to in-person engagements. We have 10 board members, including Alana Nass from Victoria, Anne Davis from the Comox Valley, Anne McFarlane from Victoria, Claire Moglau from Campbell River, MJ Whitemarsh from Sydney, Ron Matson from View Royal, Ron Rice, a member of the Couch and Tribes who lives in Victoria, who you will hear from shortly, and Shawnee Casavant, a New Chelneth woman from Cayucut and Diane Brennan from Nanaimo. As a governance board, we are responsible for the overall direction of Island Health and accountable to those we serve in communities. And although board members are not on the screen tonight, they are watching from home alongside each of you. As board members, we are appointed by the Minister of Health, but the reason we choose to sit on a healthcare board is because we care deeply about health and care in communities. For me, as a former public health nurse, deputy minister of health and chair of Canadian Blood Services, my focus has always been on doing what is right for the patient. Each of our board members has joined the board because of their personal commitment. And tonight I have asked Ron Rice to say a few words of welcome from the board of directors. My name is Ron Rice. I'm from Couch and Tribes here on Vancouver Island. My hereditary name is Wushk. I'm the Executive Director of the Victorian Native Friendship Centre and on the Board of Directors for Island Health. On behalf of the uh, Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you to this virtual forum uh, in the Couch and Valley. As an Indigenous Director to this board, uh, it's important for me to consider how uh, patients and, and caregivers and, and loved ones of patients are engaging with the healthcare system and I want to make sure that they feel heard and safe and uh, cared for. Thank you, Ron. Joining us this evening is Dr. Shannon Waters, Medical Health Officer for the region, 
Aileen B. Arneson, Vice President, Clinical Operations for the South Island, including the Couch and Valley, and local Couch and leaders, Alice Gelke, Executive Director, and Dr. Michelle Weitzel, Executive Medical Director. Kathy McNeil is the President and CEO of Island Health and will be my co-host this evening. Kathy? Thank you, Leah, and good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased to be able to join you tonight and have the opportunity to hear from the people of Couch and Valley. Despite the pandemic and our inability to meet in person, there has been a lot of activity in the Couch and Valley alongside our partners in the community as we continue our important work, including advancing the Couch and Valley Health and Care Plan and the replacement of the Couch and District Hospital. Aileen will provide an update this evening on where we are today with respect to the project. Earlier this year, I was grateful to join Elder Albie Charlie from the Cowichan Tribes and Aaron Stone from the Cowichan Valley Regional Hospital District for the official land transfer of the hospital site. As project partners, we acknowledge the lands of the Cowichan Tribes and committed to working and walking respectfully with all the nations within the Cowichan Valley as we build a new place of healing, including the Malahat Nation, Halalt, Lyaxon, Suminis, Penelicut, the Didot, and Subaset First Nation. The Cowichan Valley is a growing and vibrant area. Tonight, you will hear about some of the exciting work underway in the community to meet the needs today as we work towards providing health and care to support the health and wellness of the community for generations to come, including the new hospital. Earlier today, the board of directors heard from the Cowichan District, sorry, Division of Family Practice and our primary care team about the important work being done to connect patients to primary care providers, family doctors, nurse practitioners, and social workers working in teams. Despite the pandemic and the ongoing challenges in recruitment for healthcare workers, local partners are advancing work in connecting patients. But the work they're doing is far more than simply connecting to one health provider. They're approaching the work as a community team where patients have access to mental, physical, and medical health to support their health and wellness. It's this type of support that will provide patients with the right care at the right time with the right health provider to support their unique needs throughout their lives. It takes more than one organization to advance health and care needs within a community. I want to thank the provincial government and all of our partners within the Cowichan Valley for their ongoing commitment and support of health and care. I also want to thank each and every community member for continuing to protect each other during the pandemic, for getting a vaccination, for following the measures that have kept each other safe, and for supporting the people who work on the front lines, including our team of healthcare workers. What you have done and continue to do makes a difference to all of us. Thank you, Kathy. Tonight's discussion will help the board better understand what matters to those living in the Couch and Valley and gain a broader understanding of health and care needs in your communities. Thank you to Shannon, Alice, Michelle, and Aileen for participating in the panel tonight. As local leaders, you bring Island Health Vision to life. The area we are focused on tonight is the Couch and Valley. The questions we will address are directly related to this region. Dr. Waters will provide a local public health update and information on the community immunization program. And then Aileen will provide an organizational update. And then we will ask Alice, Michelle, Shannon, and Aileen to respond to questions from you, the members of your community. For those joining us, we will begin with some health and care care questions pre-submitted and then move into the live questions for those who have joined us on Facebook. Kathy and I will take turns reading out the questions to our three panelists. If you didn't get a chance to submit a question ahead of time, you can submit a question now in the chat of the Facebook live feed. 
Before we go into questions, though, I invite Dr. Waters to provide some opening remarks. Shannon? Hi, Shta. Hi, Quinayant. Good evening. As a member of Stamanus First Nation, with many family ties to Couch and Tribes, I wanted to share that it is my honor, privilege, and challenge to work as a medical health officer within my home territory. With the time I have tonight, I wanted to take us on a short collective journey through three crises we find ourselves in that are near and dear to my heart and mind as a public health physician and a Hulkamitnam woman. The drug poisoning crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the climate change crisis. I want to acknowledge that the creation of a medical health officer position in 2017, specific to the Couch and Valley, was brought about due to the fact that we were over a year into a public health emergency due to drug poisoning deaths. A lot of work has been undertaken to try and address this emergency, some of which will be mentioned later this evening. There is also a lot of work still to be done to address the underlying systemic issues and mental health stigma that continue to fuel this emergency. I want to acknowledge that in 2020, we lost 26 lives to this emergency within the Cowichan Valley. And up until July 31st of this year, we have lost another 16 lives. My condolences go out to the whole community in this regard. As I imagine, there is no one in this community that has not been impacted in some way by this crisis. And similar to how we have experienced the drug poisoning crisis causing grief, stress, and at times tension in our communities, we have simultaneously been in a COVID-19 pandemic. In the first round of the COVID-19 speak survey in May of 2020, 46% of Island Health residents reported worsening of mental health. In households with children, this was even higher. At the same time, 67% of Island Health residents reported feeling a strong sense of community belonging. And then just over six months later, the first COVID-19 vaccines were being administered within Island Health. And a massive undertaking happened over the course of this year to get us to the point where 84% of eligible Island Health residents have received two doses of vaccine. Within our region, our two-dose coverage ranges from 72 to 80% across our three local health areas. This vaccine coverage has gone a long way in allowing us to do the activities and see the people we care about. We are currently in step three of BC's restart plan. We reached the target of over 70% of the adult population vaccinated with a first dose, but the Delta variant has necessitated a delay in moving to step four, as we do not currently have low COVID-19 case counts or declining COVID-19 hospitalizations. Our current vaccines are very effective against COVID-19. Delta is a more contagious variant, however, and in September, we did see that 23% of our cases within Island Health were fully vaccinated. Vaccinated individuals who acquire COVID do not carry as much virus, and the levels that they have fall quicker than in unvaccinated individuals. This means there is much less transmission of infection than in unvaccinated individuals. Vaccinated individuals as a group also have less severe illness. Our hospitalizations are rising primarily because some unvaccinated individuals are becoming very sick. Of the 42 individuals we currently have across hospitals in Island Health, 93% of them are unvaccinated. So after 19 months of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are now again in the stressful situation of trying to keep our hospitals from being overwhelmed to try and decrease COVID transmission and increase vaccine coverage, there have been provincial orders put in place requiring a vaccine card to access some events, businesses and services. There are also upcoming orders for mandatory vaccination in work settings, such as long-term care and assisted living. And announced today some approaches for the BC Public Service. Our goal is to continue to increase vaccine coverage which will decrease severe illness and deaths due to COVID-19. The challenge is to try and do this in a way that does not increase tension within the community and that we can still build on a strong sense of community belonging during this awkward time. 
finding ways to de-stress through means such as showing support for each other or being in contact with our natural environment are important protective factors during this challenging time. Which brings us to our last crisis I will mention this evening, that of our natural environment. I imagine many of you, like I, tried to take time with family and friends this summer to relax and enjoy this beautiful place we live in. As climate projections from the Cowichan Valley Regional District have described, however, we had a summer that was hotter and drier than those we have experienced in the past. The summer started with an unprecedented hot weather event that affected most regions of the province. This heat dome lasted over five days and certain areas of the Cowichan Valley got as hot as 45 degrees Celsius. For some people that heat level meant they were staying in their air conditioned home or another air conditioned building they had access to. For others that meant going for a dip in local rivers, lakes or the ocean. Some had to access healthcare due to ill effects they were experiencing. And unfortunately some experienced an earlier death because of the heat effects. Across BC, the increased mortality due to the heat was limited in those under 65 years of age and pronounced in those older than 65 years of age. Mortality was increased in all settings, but markedly increased in the community setting. I want to acknowledge the work that happened within First Nations communities, at municipal levels, in neighborhood settings, and also with our local health network, our Cowichan. Cooling centers were set up and through collaborative efforts, we got in touch with our fellow community members to determine if they needed help in cooling down. There are debriefs occurring over the winter months on the impacts and responses to this heat dome so that, so that we can be better prepared in the future. Beyond stress for the human population, this heat event also stressed the plants, animals, and water we share the environment with. The heat caused drastic drying across the islands and the province, fueling as has happened in many recent summers an intense wildfire season. Holy Oak Creek and Mount Hay wildfires occurred in our region this past summer. While wildfires are a natural and necessary event, their intensity and duration is increasing. As shown in the health profile put out by our community, Cowichan Community Health Network earlier this year, the Cowichan Valley is particularly vulnerable to the negative health effects of tiny particulate matter from wildfire smoke as asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are higher across all our local health areas compared to Island Health Region as a whole. The important work at our Cowichan Airshed Roundtable is being re rekindled, bringing Island Health together with other partners to look at strategies and actions to improve our air quality. The World Health Organization released new air quality guidelines just last month, which can help to save millions of lives as well as advance climate change mitigation efforts. I am proud of the fact that through the Airshed Roundtable, we are also doing this work locally. And from the Airshed, I turn finally to the watersheds, which were also extremely stressed recently. For a month of this past summer season, we were in level five drought. This was the first time anywhere across the province reached this level. And this level states that adverse impacts to socioeconomic or ecosystem values are almost certain. This event undoubtedly had impact on our health as the watershed touches the lives of all in the Cowichan Valley region through means such as being a source of drinking water, an important player in food security as a home for species such as salmon, a place for recreation, solace, and cultural practices that support our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health, and as an important resource for income security of those whose jobs are connected with the watershed. Island Health is assessing the impact of the recent drought through a survey of local water system operators to, to help determine next steps in preparing for future summers. The fall has now arrived with cooler temperatures and rains, but this does not mean we can ignore the urgency of impacts on our natural environment and how this so fundamentally impacts our collective health. I, along with other Island Health colleagues, am committed to working with First Nations, municipalities, our local health network, and other partners in preparing for the times coming ahead. 
we need to think about our relationship with this place we collectively call home and how we interact with it to build resilience. It is really important that we are building a new hospital here in the Cowichan Valley region. But after this summer of heat, smoke and drought, we also need to start with acknowledging that our ecosystem is our health system. Thanks. Thank you very much, Shannon. Those uh, messages are just so important and I think we need to hear them over and over and over again until they really sink in for each and every one of us. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Now, Aylan, I'm going to ask you to provide an organizational update before we start the Q's and A's. Well, thanks, Leah. And thanks, Dr. Waters, for that um, really informative overview. Um, and talk, first talk a little bit about the pandemic. It's brought awareness of the importance of public health in our care teams, and it's also highlighted the individual role we each have in keeping ourselves and each other safe and helping to preserve our health system. Vaccines have and continue to make a difference. We know approximately 85% of all hospitalizations are for those under vaccinated. And Dr. Waters highlighted the vast majority who get seriously ill are under vaccinated. For your own sake, for your family's sake, and for the sake of our health system, please get vaccinated. We're working hard to plan and be prepared for the fall and winter, which is always our busiest time of year in healthcare. As we head into the fall and flu season, it's important to also remember the importance of getting your flu shot so we can be as we start to begin to be indoors again and the flu season is upon us. Please continue to practice what you've practiced and kept safe from COVID, washing your hands, staying home when you're not well, and following public health orders. This will also help reduce other viral illnesses. I'm gonna, I am going to provide a brief update on the work of Island Health in supporting health and care in the Cowichan Valley. But before I do that, I would like to recognize last Thursday, the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. For survivors of residential schools and their families, fall marks a time of heaviness and sorrow with the memory of forced removal of children from family and community. The coming weeks and months will be difficult as communities to continue to explore the lands of the main five residential schools in our region resurfacing pain, suffering, and sorrow. It's a time when connections and supporting each other is so important. As a health provider, I want to let you know if you need support, there are resources available. Our digital engagement team will post some resources as we go through the rest of this session. As an organization, we are committed to delivering on the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report. We want to create a culturally safe health system. We've made some positive progress. Like earlier this year, we announced the first Indigenous navigator position at Saanich Peninsula Hospital, with plans to expand the, extend this into other communities, including the Valley, Cowichan Valley, through a partnership with the Sunamu First Nation. This is but one example, and we know there's much, much more we need to do as an organization and as individuals, and we're very committed to that. I'm now going to provide an update on the work Island Health is doing to support health services in the Cowichan Valley. We have developed a, a plan called the Cowichan Health and Care Plan. The goal of the Cowichan Health and Care Plan is to enhance community health services to ensure people get the right care at the right time and reduce the need for hospital days. We don't wanna just build a new hospital. We wanna improve the health of the people of the couch and Valley through community-based services and at a state-of-the-art hospital facility. Through implementation of specific community services, including respiratory care, seniors care, enhanced palliative services, substance use support, and increased long-term care beds, we can enable people to get services as close to home as possible and to live healthier lives. The region is growing and to meet the needs today and into the future will require a comprehensive plan, which the hospital is a part of, but it'll support the health and wellness through all stages of life. 
As you may be aware, the Cowichan District Hospital Replacement Project is well underway. 206, it, it will have 204 bed capacity. It'll be nearly three times larger than the current facility. Has a budget of 900 million and the CVRHD is funding 282 million of that. We're currently working through the procurement process as part of the capital planning process where we look at the proposed design and provide feedback. In early 2022, the builder will be selected along with the final design of the hospital. In mid-2022, we will break ground and we're scheduled to open in the fall of 2026. Hearing from the community is an important part of our planning. The project team is providing quarterly community updates. And in addition to this, they have targeted engagement with local businesses, with patient partners, indigenous partners, community organizations, and other government organizations. Indigenous engagement and cultural safety continues to be a top priority for planning. This is essential to ensure culturally safe services and spaces are incorporated into the new hospital. We have established a comprehensive approach to support input from First Nations, communities, Métis, Inuit people, as well as for those living off reserve. We wanna thank our community partners who are supporting this hospital development, the Cowichan Valley Regional Hospital District, the Cowichan District Hospital Foundation, the Cowichan District Medical Society, the Municipality of North Cowichan, and all First Nations and Indigenous partners. For more information, you can go to the Island Health website and look up new CBH. In addition to the Cowichan Health and Care Plan and the new hospital project, we have many other service enhancements occurring. Home-based services have been enhanced throughout the COVID pandemic. We've done this in a number of ways. We've increased home supports in the home. We have increased access to virtual services and home health monitoring. We've hired more home attendants as part of our community health services team. And we're working with partners to support care. Those partners like BCEHS and paramedics to enhance palliative services in the home. As Dr. Water discussed, the toxic drug supply and the overdose public health emergency continues. And we continue to have a severe impact across BC, including in the Cowichan Valley. No community, family, or person is immune. The complexity of mental health and substance use is one we cannot solve alone. It will continue to take the efforts of many partners, all levels of government, health providers, and each of us as individuals. We know there are huge pressures on the system and gaps, and the opening of the new Wellness and Recovery Center will bring together a range of services for the underserved population, including harm reduction, overdose prevention, opioid agonist treatment, psychotherapy, assertive community treatment, and outreach teams. There is so much more we could say on this topic alone. I wanna thank the province and the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions for their continued support and investment. The last two areas I'll briefly touch on are long-term care and our surgical renewal work. Throughout the COVID pandemic, seniors housing and the critical need for it and high quality care has been front and center throughout Canada. In the Cowichan Valley, the Hamlet's long-term care home in Duncan it will be adding 80 publicly funded beds in a supportive environment for seniors. To date, we've opened 32 beds and we continue to work and support the provider in the staffing that they need to open the remainder of the beds. Just as in many other areas in the health field, there's a tremendous need to expand our workforce. Our digital team will post a vir virtual tour of the Hamlets if you're interested in looking at that. For surgical renewal, the COVID has had an impact in many areas and on surgery is one of those areas. As you may remember in wave one across BC, surgeries were slowed down to ensure access to hospitals for patients with COVID and critical illness. In our region, after the initial pause in surgeries at the beginning of COVID, we were able to fully recover and provide surgery to all those who were postponed. We've also continued to advance reducing our wait lists and improving access. 
In Cowichan, we've recently added an additional day for cataract surgery and extended an additional room for joint surgery. The fourth wave of the pandemic has once again placed a strain on our ability to deliver surgeries, but we're working hard to continue to expand and support access and limit the disruption that may be needed to support access because of COVID. I'd like to close by saying we have such an amazing group of care providers in Cowichan who are committed to the people of this region. I want to acknowledge the work these dedicated professionals do. The board and our leadership team truly appreciate you. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today and to be here today. Thank you so much, Aileen, for commenting on the services that exist and the services that are coming. I agree that there's a lot of excitement up in Couch and Kathy and I were there last week for a truth and reconciliation event and um, everybody just seems to really pull together and it's fantastic to watch. So thank you for that. Thank you both to you and Shannon for your remarks. And now we're going to turn to the questions. We'll start with some questions that, are, that were submitted in advance. And we'll do our best to get through as many questions as we can tonight. The first question we have tonight is from Cynthia. Her question is related to the new hospital. She asks, how are parents being engaged as part of the ER, day surgery, and pediatric unit for the hospital? And I'm going to ask Alice if she would answer that question. Thank you, Leah, and thank you for the question. Patient input is incredibly important to the hospital planning process. And there are a number of new features in the new couch and hospital that include pediatric considerations based on the input we receive from parents during business planning. The project team will be reaching out to parents for more detailed input as we prepare for design and construction. Some of the planned new features based on parent recommendations include that children being cared for on a pediatric unit will be cared on the pediatric unit before their surgery, and then immediately following, they will recover in an anesthesia area unit and then return back to the pediatric unit to receive care until they are discharged. There'll also be an outpatient clinical space on the pediatric unit as well as some clinical spaces in ambulatory care. As well, there'll be treatment rooms and a waiting area in the emergency department that are designed to accommodate children, but will also be flexible for other emergency care needs as well. There'll also be four private bedrooms for child youth mental health care in the pediatric unit, in addition to another four pediatric med surge private bedrooms. There'll be some upcoming patient partner opportunities and in October, November and December of this year, the project team will be reaching out to the community to encourage people with lived experience accessing healthcare services in Cow at the Cowichan Hospital to serve as volunteer patient partners on the project. After orientation, these partners will be able to review proposed solutions and provide feedback during the design and construction phase of the project and will work with programs and the project team to ensure the services and designs reflect the needs of the people who will be receiving care at the new hospital. Thank you, Alice. That's so exciting to hear about. And thank you, Cynthia, for, for being interested in asking the question. The next question comes from Mary, who asks, what is the role that Island Health takes in overseeing the health care at School District 79? Shannon, I'm wondering if you can speak to this. Sure. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks, Mary. Um, I'll start off by saying that as a medical health officer, I have some statutory responsibilities for health and safety in school, specifically from a piece of legislation called the School Health Act. Also, within public health, we have a small number of staff who uh, support school districts and schools to implement strategies around healthy schools that are referred to by the Ministry of Health in um, a focus on comprehensive school health. Uh, these are not focused on individual children or youth, 
they're focused more on areas such as physical activity, health literacy, healthy eating, wellness, and mental health. In sometimes within some schools, there are youth clinics and youth wellness centers, but sometimes they're located in facilities other than schools. Uh, these clinics or centers offer a variety of health services, including sexual health, mental health, and substance use. Some have primary care providers. Um, these services may be in the school, but are confidential health services and the consent for services provided by the youth. But e e each area, each school district, this looks different across the island health region. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you, Mary, for that question. There's lots of uh, discussion these days about what's going on in schools. And although they're not focused as broadly as this, this is an important, very important question. So thank you for that. The next question is from Christine, who is a senior accessing home and community support. She requires service to maintain independence, but her concern is regarding the policy of having to contain her dog when support workers arrive. To do this, she requires her to use her walker to contain the dog. This practice is dangerous and very stressful. She understands some dogs are aggressive, which is why the policy exists, but she feels the policy doesn't support her. Alice, could I get you to respond to that? Certainly, and thank you, Christine, for the question. Our goal in community health services is to support and improve the health and quality of life to help people remain independent and in their own home. We also, though, have a responsibility to ensure our staff have safe environments in which to work. As an employer, we are obligated to uh, align our occupational health and safety policies for our community staff with WorkSafe BC safety requirements. Your point is well taken around assessing pets for aggression and balancing out the individual client situation with this assessment and we will take the suggestion forward to our occupational health and safety and community health services teams to explore the delivery of safe care and Christine's wishes for independence, including her dog being at present during care. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. The next question is from Ryan, who asks, with the rapidly expanding population in the Cowichan Valley, Will the new hospital include hospitalists or will GPs, family doctors, still do rounds on their admitted patients? I think, Michelle, this one is over to you. Thanks, Kathy. And thanks, Ryan, for the question. You know, Island Health values having family physicians provide care to their patients within hospital and local Island Health leadership in Cowichan works collaboratively with the Cowichan Division of Family Practice who represent those local physicians to determine a path forward for inpatient care that supports GPs who want to continue to provide bedside care to their patients in the hospital, as well as developing a plan for those patients who do not have family physicians or whose family physicians do not provide inpatient care. Thanks, Michelle, and thank you, Ryan. This brings up another important question about recruiting healthcare workers. And Alice, I'd like to ask you to speak to the work we're doing around recruitment in the Couch and Valley. Um, we're experiencing staff shortages nationally, provincially, and within our health authority, and Cowichan is no exception. Within Cowichan, though, we've established a workforce planning group that has broad representation from local leaders, decision support, and human resources. This group is overseeing a number of initiatives to support recruitment that include, for example, additional support for our operational managers to facilitate hiring, undertaking exit interviews for our staff, whereby we incorporate the learnings into, um, into action, such as the creation of flexible work schedules, we're also working with the Island Health Indigenous Employment Team to explore opportunities for hiring within local Indigenous communities. In anticipation of the CDH Replacement Hospital, we've hired dedicated human resource support with experience from the North Island Hospital's implementation. 
our ability to promote the new hospital as a state of an art facility that it's, is also supporting our recruitment efforts, as is the enhancement of community services through our health and care plan, which is enabling us to sequence the hiring of our staff as we lead up to the opening of the new facility. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. And uh, certainly that is a question that's uh, weighing heavy on many of us in leadership roles these days is how, how are we going to uh, find the talent that we need to do this important work for communities? So thank you for the work that you're doing here in Cowichan Valley. Before we go uh, to the live questions, I just wanna take a moment to provide an update on the Wellness and Recovery Center. Aileen spoke to that in her comments. And I know Shannon, you've been quite involved in the uh, planning and discussions uh, with community. I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about the importance of this center and when it will be open. The Wellness and Recovery Center is going to be bringing some key mental health and substance use services together from across our region. Um, it's a three floor building and on the first floor will be the overdose prevention site where people can, who use substances can use in a safe and non judgmental space. They'll have clean supplies and there's people there who can intervene in case of an overdose. Um, there will also be people there who um, clients can make connections with if they want to get recommendations or referrals to other healthcare services. Also on the first floor, there will be primary care physicians providing addiction medicine services, as well as the tablet injectable opioid agonist therapy program. This is a program that provides pharmaceutical grade medication as an alternative to the toxic drug supply. And it's specifically targeted for those who haven't benefited from other treatment options or are at high risk of an overdose. And then on the third floor, we'll have um, Island Health MHSU services, including the substance use outreach uh, services team, a nurse practitioner, and um, some of the admin support. And in terms of when it's opening, the third floor services will be moving in quite soon within uh, in mid-October. And the OPS and the TIOT program, that tablet injectable opioid program, will be aiming to open in early November. Thanks, Shannon. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Ava? Um, well, you know, one of the things that uh, I, that is um, important about um, how we've developed this is the community input around the operations. Um, so we retained an external co consultant that helped to guide our engagement process. And this began last spring. Um, we had an engagement process that in, entailed a number of virtual town halls. Uh, and we had stakeholders included in that, local government, First Nations, MLAs, uh, members of parliament, uh, the couch and leadership table, and, um, and the school board. Um, so three public, three, also three public engagement sessions were held on May 19th and 20th virtually, which were extremely well attended. And going forward, we're setting up a community advisory committee with a board, with a broad range of community representatives participating. Um, so it, it's, it's a really important uh, for us um, around this participation and community engagement and input. And this service is, um, will be transformational for many people um, uh, within, the, within the population that it serves. So we're, we're thrilled to have it and we um, want the ongoing community involvement and feedback as we continue to um, grow um, the service. Excellent, thanks, Aileen. We're go now going to turn to live questions. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question and thank you to the social media team who is monitoring our social media channels and responding to questions online during the event. Earlier when Aileen spoke, she mentioned the number of beds for the new hospital at a capacity of 204. And Becky asks what the current number of acute care beds at CDH is and how 
many can we expect to see in the new hospital? So Aylin, can I ask you to respond to that? Um, sure. Uh, I, I believe we have 135 beds in the CDH now. Is that correct, Al? 134. 134, thank you. Um, so we have 134 beds. Uh, we do at times go over occupancy, um, but uh, the team has done an incredible job in supporting um, uh, staying uh, within that, that bed base. Um, so we're so it's a substantial increase, and this was um, intentionally done. Uh, so I mentioned the community health and care plan, and our intention is to really support um, investments in the community around the different services that I talked about: uh, palliative care, seniors care, respiratory care, um, and uh, amongst other other uh, services, so that we're reducing the dependency on the hospital and helping to support people in their population health. Um, so uh, that work um, is setting us up to move in and have some empty beds when we move into the hospital. Um, this is a hospital for the future. Uh, hospitals um, typically last for over 40 years. Um, so when we move in, we currently have 134 beds. Um, by the time we move in in 2026, we'll likely need more than that. Um, between 160 and 180, but we will be leaving some capacity um, to grow into. Thanks, Aylin. I'm sorry, I misspoke myself and it was actually Alice who was going to answer that question. So I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you did a very good job. Thank you. Okay. Alice, Alice, Leah, you Leah, if I could just add to Aylin's uh, answer, just a, a couple of other points. So in 2026, we will be opening 185 beds with capacity for 204 beds. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to ask, the, uh, ask and, and try to answer the next question because it's a very important question. And I think um, uh, it's a question that many of us are holding in leadership roles here at Island Health. So someone on Facebook has asked us how Island Health is addressing the systemic racism in care of First Nations people. And uh, we have identified uh, uh, Indigenous specific anti-racism as a key area of focus uh, for our organization over the past three years. And what um, we've put together a strategy um, uh, in engage through engaging community and uh, our partners at First Nations Health Authority, the First Nations Health Council and local communities. Uh, to, to define what our areas of focus should be over the next three years. The, we have had a number of uh, reports uh, uh, telling us the way, <laughs> telling us what we need to do differently. So we've had the recommendations that we've spoken of already tonight in terms of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, report and the specific recommendations uh, with respect to healthcare and healthcare services. We've had the reports and recommendations from the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. We've had a report uh, called Paddling Together, which has, was done in partnership with the New Chalmers Tribal Council. We've had uh, a report um, also in plain sight uh, by Dr. Mary Ellen Trapelafon that uh, uh, was a recent report uh, uh, speaking to the experience of First Nations people in BC's health system. So there are many recommendations and what uh, our team has done has, has focused uh, our response in some key areas. One is around uh, cultural safety and humility. And so there are system initiatives and local kind of individual actions around our own cultural safety and humility awareness, some training as well as uh, supports that we, we need uh, systemically. You heard uh, Aylin speak to um, the Indigenous patient navigator role that has been instituted, um, uh, started at Saanich Peninsula with an uh, intention to have those in emergency departments across the island so that uh, emergency departments feel like a more safe place, certainly, uh, uh, in the uh, In Plain Sight report, we heard a lot about the experiences of um, discrimination of racism in receiving emergency care as kind of the front door of uh, the healthcare system in hospitals. 
And so um, that's a really good place to ensure that uh, uh, people are feeling like it's safe to come for care because that's what we want to make sure that access is safe. Um, we also have uh, uh, um, created um, Indigenous uh, leadership for this work in having a, an executive, a vice president of Indigenous health who uh, is on our team, uh, Don Thomas, who is a member of the Sunamuk Nation, uh, uh, is, has been now borrowed by the Ministry of Health to be their associate deputy minister as they work through, um, at a provincial level, the, the in-plane site uh, review report. And so in her place, we have Eunice Joe, who's serving as the acting vice president of Indigenous Health. It's really important that we have um, Indigenous leadership uh, walking with us as we do this work. Um, uh, those settlers, myself, I don't know what I don't know. And while I'm on my own journey, I, um, I am learning as I go. And so uh, to walk with in partnership, to have that visible presence in our leadership team reminds us every day that this work is work that we need to do in partnership with, with patients, families, and communities. Uh, the last thing I'll just say is that we've heard time and time again that our patient complaint process is not culturally safe. And so there's much work happening at the provincial level as well as the local level to look at how we can um, make it safe to get feedback about our care. We can't make it better unless we get that feedback and we can work with specific circumstances in sp specific cases. And so there's some work happening in partnership with uh, friendship centers to, to make it uh, create a safe space. And that's in fact what the tool's called, safe space, to hear patient stories that are anonymized that can be fed back to the health system so that people don't feel that um, there's any fear of, of repercussion or any um, attribution to individuals of the comments that, that we need to hear. Uh, so uh, friendship centers are, are serving as that in that uh, capacity to provide us that kind of uh, case specific feedback. And we're also working as um, we, we do case reviews when things don't go right to ensure that uh, our First Nations Health Authority partners are, are sitting with us in those case reviews so that um, we, we make sure that those reviews reflect culturally safe uh, perspective and an Indigenous perspective in, um, in, our, uh, in understanding uh, where we went wrong and how we can do better. So those are some examples of the work. Uh, all of the health authorities are working with uh, Dawn Thomas in her capacity as the Associate Deputy. And as well, there's been a task force that's created at the provincial level that guides us um, uh, very much reflective of Indigenous and non-Indigenous leadership across BC to ensure that we are taking real steps of change uh, to change the experience of those uh, who've experienced healthcare um, and a healthcare system that has not necessarily been safe. Thank you for Thank asking. Thanks, Kathy. I, I think it's fair to say that the board is very focused on cultural safety and have been taking every opportunity to learn and understand. So it's been much appreciated by the board that the leadership at Island Health also has been focused on the same area. Now I have a question off of Facebook from Amanda who asks why there has been little transparency on the COVID vaccine adverse reactions. And Shannon, I wonder if I could ask you to answer that. Um, so let me start off by saying that um, adverse reactions to all vaccines, including the COVID vaccine are taken very seriously within public health. Uh, myself as a medical health officer, one of my roles in my regular day-to-day -day work is reviewing adverse events following immunization that occur within the Cowichan Valley region. Uh, during this time of the massive COVID vaccine rollout, uh, we have one specific um, uh, medical health officer who's been um, tasked with reviewing AFIs that may come in 
and that's to help um, you know uh, you know build familiar familiarity with the process, and then also to you know have a kind of systematic approach to how they're looked at. Uh, um, most of the adverse events that are um, seen are, are mild. They're similar to other added perverse events we might see from other vaccines. So, you know, soreness in the area, sometimes a bit of redness, some general um, symptoms such as uh, fatigue, what have you. But we do rarely have um, more serious events. Those are compiled at a provincial level mm -hmm. because um, the signal for these rare events can be very hard to see. And so we compile them at a provincial level and then that is um, examined and reported at that level. So it's not that, um, uh, you know, it's, so, so there is reporting that recurs around that and it's, um, you know, looked at very, uh, uh, very seriously and carefully. Thanks, Shannon. Um, speaking of the provincial level, could you also uh, talk a little bit about the question of whether the vaccine passport has been discussed any further given the amount of Delta variant that's around and given that, as Amanda describes it, seems to be able to be passed on even by people who are vaccinated sometimes? Yeah, sure. So Basically, COVID is something we're going to be learning to live with as a community, as a province around the world. So we are not trying to get to zero cases. What we're hoping to do and what we have a vaccine that helps us to do is prevent very serious outcomes from uh, infection with COVID-19. So what I would say is that even though some vaccinated people can pass on um, infection, it's, it's rare, it's much rarer than in unvaccinated individuals. Mm -hmm. And what we're ultimately trying to prevent is people getting very ill and going into the hospital system. The vaccine passport system was never seen as a permanent measure. It will be a temporary measure, and that will depend on when we see uh, lower numbers of individuals getting very sick and needing hospitalization from COVID-19, which is directly related to our vaccination rates. Great. Thanks very much, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. And um, I'm going to try and get through. We have two more questions and we're running out of time. So um, this one is a question uh, that Christine has asked us on Facebook. Um, Wondering what the plans are for the old hospital. Um, she says she realizes it has had its own issues, but given the massive costs and problems that we have with homelessness, she believes it would be an ideal site for an exciting, groundbreaking, life-changing and saving facility. So I'm not wondering, Alice or Aylin, um, I'm, I know we're early days yet. We may not have a lot of information on that, but is there anything you'd like to be able to share with Christine? Yeah, um, you're right, Kathy. We don't have a final answer on that yet. Um, and we have moved out of a number of very old buildings, um, not quite as old as uh, Couch and District Hospital um, when we've moved into new long-term care facilities recently. And though we use them right up until we move out of them, there are massive problems with the buildings. And so um, we need to look at that um, but it's a, it's a really interesting idea, um, and it's a great question about that site and the land, and so I really thank you for asking that. Um, we're still talking about whether that building comes down as part of the contract for building the new building, and as I said, we're just going through that procurement process, um, but I'll take that back because I think um, we need to look at all great options to support housing for underserved disadvantages and low income. So I really appreciate that, Christine, and we'll, we'll follow up with that. Thanks, Aileen. And last question. Um, I love this question. Shauna, thank you for asking, and I can't wait to meet your daughter. Uh, Shauna's daughter will finish her RN degree next year. Uh, she has worked with homeless and First Nations community and will be an exceptional nurse, and as well as navigating a pandemic and pushing through. Uh, she has lots to be proud of. She does have student loans. And the question is, will there be some student loan relief? She'll be an RN in Cowich and when she graduates. 
And uh, Shauna, what I can say is there is a, an initiative at the provincial government level around healthcare recruitment. So um, I know many options around incentives, loan relief, housing, all of those things are being uh, discussed and planned as we speak. Um, as uh, Aylin and Alice both said, uh, healthcare workforce is in demand across the country, certainly across the province and across Vancouver Island. And so we'll work with our provincial partners to advocate for uh, incentives like uh, student loan relief so that we can ensure that we make it easy for people to enter our workforce. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Kathy. Before I close tonight, I have one last question from Cindy Lees from our Cowichan Communities Health Network, who asked if the board or a representative would be willing to sit down to have a deeper conversation with our Cowichan Communities regarding the social determinants of health. Thank you to our Cowichan Communities Health Network for your commitment to supporting health and wellness. When I reflect on your vision, where all people of Couch and Valley enjoy health and well being, I see an organization that closely aligns with Island Health's vision. We are very appreciative of your work in the Couch and Valley and the work of community health networks in all regions of Island Health. The last time the board visited the region, we had the opportunity to hear directly from our Couch. And they shared their story from 2010 forward, working on projects from housing to elder care, environment and physical literacy. Your work truly touches every aspect of community wellness. As a governance board, we are responsible for the overall direction of Island Health and we rely on our local teams of healthcare leaders to ensure we're taking the right steps to ensure we clo are closely aligned with the needs of the community. We are extraordinarily fortunate to have both Alice Gelpke and Dr. Waters representing Island Health at the table as part of our coalition. From an executive level, the health networks fall under Richard Stanwick, our Vice President Population and Public Health. And I know this work is very close to his heart and he would be very interested in hearing more from our coalition and carrying this information forward to the board. And I'd like to now invite Kathy to make a few closing remarks. Thank you, Leah. And I just wanna thank everyone for your time with us tonight. I know um, taking an evening to have this discussion is a valuable uh, part of your time. And, and we don't take that lightly that you've given us this time with you this evening. It certainly enriches us to hear what's on your mind. Um, before we, we leave, I would like to acknowledge the profound impact uh, that we've heard already tonight that COVID-19 has had on our families and our communities. Dr. Waters has spoken to that. And I'd also like to acknowledge the profound impact it's had on our health system and our health workers. Evidence shows that the vaccines are safe and effective at preventing serious illness and death. And I, we encourage all of you to get fully vaccinated to protect yourselves and your loved ones from this virus. We continue to have regularly scheduled immunization clinics in communities throughout this region, including clinics in Lake Cowichan, in Duncan, Shawnigan Lake, Crofton, and Shimanus. And we have the locations of those clinics posted on our website. If you're feeling uncertain, I would encourage you to seek advice and information from trusted, reputable sources like your primary care provider or the BC Center for Disease Control or contact our public health uh, physicians, our medical health officers like Dr. Waters here at Island Health. Before I finish, though, I would... I I do want to thank this community, Couch and Valley, for how you've held up our healthcare workers. Um, th this wave four has been particularly difficult for our teams. We've been working long and hard over the last 19 months, and we didn't think we'd be in this place, like most of our community. And what we've seen uh, has been a real rally of support in our communities. And certainly when Leah and I were in Duncan last week, we met one of the community members who 
faithfully shows up on site and thanks the healthcare workers at shifts, shift change when they are finished their work every day and the difference that that makes to our team there. Uh, so if you would like to express your gratitude to our team as we go into Thanksgiving weekend, we would love to hear from you. So please feel free to send us a message at thanks at islandhealth.ca. And all those messages of thanks to your team in the Cowichan Valley will be provided to them. Leah? Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I really appreciate you being my co-host this evening. And in particular to panel members, Shannon, Alice, Michelle, and Aylin, and those who submitted questions in advance and during tonight's event. Thank you to the staff, physicians, clinicians, and partners who continue to approach health and care with compassion and commitment. And thank you to you, the community, for participating and for those who continue to follow the public health guidelines and who have participated in the immunization program. Thank you once again for taking time to join us. And I would like to say, I'd like to reiterate what Kathy said, you have fabulous care providers in your community. So please, whenever you get a chance to, thank them for what the work they do.